Now. If you need a mic, got this. This is um, Greg Miller, who is uh, work. He's a club member. He's uh, helped us with a lot of uh, council issues, lawyer issues, and mm -hmm. helped us get our uh, our FFL. And uh, Greg is here today to talk to us about uh, the new firearms regulations. Our, is our Zoom up now, Paul? It is. Okay. So um, I just, as we get started here, just wanted to remind people, and I'm pretty sure that Greg's going to do the same thing. Um, don't view this as absolute. Don't view this as legal advice. If you've got a question, um, you know, take this as this is kind of the direction to go. Uh, but let me seek counsel and uh, and verify that it's uh, it's right because there are um, you know many many things that uh, that vary a little bit that can make a, a large difference in how things uh, work. I'm sure there's nobody in this room that wants to violate standing rules, laws, regulations. Uh, you know, we're sportsmen, and that's what this is about. Um, and it is probably very easy to make an honest mistake here that may not be treated like an honest mistake. It could turn into uh, something that was, was tragic. And I'm just saying, if you have a question, seek legal counsel. If you can't find legal counsel and there's a conservative approach to take, you know, it, whether it's, do I register or not register this thing? If you're not sure and you, you can't get good advice, um try registering it you know if, if you know that's that m1 carbine there is something that i did that to in 2013 after being told um after a call to the state that it wasn't required because it wasn't on the list it was something that i saw on the list and i said well let me just send this in and they took the registration and when i when i read the rules later on uh, it's a good thing that I did. So I'm going to turn this over to um, Greg. Thank you. And Greg has been uh, awesome with us for the, helping us with learning the ropes. Afternoon. Yeah. This is not an easy area of law to teach because some of it makes no sense. We're going to try and go through it today. Uh, the objective here today, yep, yeah, the, the objective here today is to allow all of the people in this room to determine whether or not they need to register firearms before the end of April. If they have firearms which are not registered, whether or not they can be registered, because not everything can now. And additionally, to the extent that you may have firearms in your collection which are not registered and which require registration so that you can make intelligent decisions what to do from there. Uh, I call this a history of the Connecticut assault weapons law and the 2023 revisions. Uh, I recognize a lot of the faces in this room. I've been doing this, this is my 39th year uh, practicing as a firearms attorney. Uh, I have represented a couple of the organizations, uh, some of them perhaps you've heard of. I was counsel to the NRA here in Connecticut. Uh, I've been a regular lecturer for CCDL from the beginning. Um, counsel to many of the clubs, most of the largest gun stores in the state. So we do this every day. Uh, even still, this is a very challenging area of the law. Let's go to the next slide here. Okay, so part one of this talk, how we got here, we're going to take a look at the history of these assault weapons laws, and what those original laws are. And then in part two, we're going to talk about the 2023 laws, which are the ones which require registration by the end of April. Next slide. Uh, you know, the one of the questions people call, you know, they come on in, and they say, well, what is an assault weapon? 
assault weapon was a term that was created by one of the anti-gun organizations. And we have the actual transcripts from it. We can see it where they came in and they were talking about assault rifles. And somebody said, but these aren't assault rifles. Uh, those are machine guns. And they talked about it a little bit and they decided to come up with this term assault weapon. And among themselves, they were discussing, well, people won't know the difference between assault rifle and assault weapon, and we'll make people think that these are military weapons. Today, however, the term assault weapon has been codified within Connecticut statutes, within other state statutes, and we're going to talk about those. Next slide. Okay. An assault weapon is not a thing. When you ask me what is an assault weapon, it's not a thing. It's a creature of statute. An assault weapon is merely a firearm which has been defined as such by the state. Next slide. Um, how did the legislature pass these laws? Okay. So um, I was trying to figure some of this out when the 2023 Act came out. And I went over to the state police and spoke with key people over there. And, and I brought with me a copy of the new laws they were about to adopt. And, and I had a whole list of questions there. And I said, what does this mean? What was the answer I got? No clue. The legislature did not consult with us. Legislators never asked the state police before they passed this law whether or not this made any sense and or whether or not the state police had the ability to implement what they were passing. This is a trend that we have seen over and over again. The legislature comes in, they pass a law, now how are we going to do it? And they find that there is no ability to do it, and I'm going to predict today uh, – when we look at, forget the pre-bans, when we merely look at the so-called others, and we'll talk about what that is, the state police have registered with them currently 94,000. So how long is it going to take them to go through 94,000 applications? The number of pre-bans may be similar. So maybe we got 150, 180,000. Let's assume that they've got three people up there doing it and they can do one every 10 minutes. I'm not sure I have enough years left that I will ever actually see my, my registration. These things may be pending on their site forever. We shall see. Okay, next. All right. Um, if you kind of wonder what the process looks like of how all of this is going to work, uh, if anybody played this game of the day, this is probably about my best guess of the outcome here with all of this. All right. The old classic quote, those who cannot remember the past are doomed to repeat it. Um, we're going to go back to the past. People come to me and they say, how do I understand the 2023 law? And you cannot understand what needs to be registered unless you understand the laws that came before it. Unless you have that totality of the laws, there is almost no way to get through this. But we're going to try. Next. Okay. When we look at the 2023 law and what we look at what we need to get there, the current law is an amalgamation of five different public acts. The first one was passed back in 1993. Got PA 91-306. 93-306. Got to put my glasses on. I hate this. Okay. Then the list of banned guns get expanded to include characteristics in 2001 under PA 01-130. The list is modified to provide for some exemptions to fix some of this in 2003 under PA 02130. The list then is further expanded in 2013 as part of PA 13 3 and PA 13 220, which they had to come in again to fix the things that didn't work when they passed it the first time. Of course, they didn't fix it, they band aided it but at least they tried to do some of it. And of course, what we're going to talk about in the second part today, where we've seen the expansion again in 2023 under SHB 667. Next slide. Okay. The original law, which became codified 
um, into Connecticut law as Connecticut General Statute 53-202A at sequence and continued, listed 56 specified guns. Um, some of you in the room may have been there back in 93 as part of the debates. I certainly was. Um, and what the legislature said to us, we're not going to take all of your guns and any of the guns you already have, you can keep at worst. You'll have to register them, but we're only going to regulate a specific list of 56 guns. So this will be really easy to understand all you'll have to do is read the list. Well, this seemed perfectly reasonable to people who knew nothing about the topic. Next page. All right, here's the list. And one of the confusions that we have today is if you have a pre-ban, a pre-ban did not previously require registration. Well, I hear people tell me, well, the, the pre-ban list, you have to look at this list with 200 guns on it from 2013. No, you don't. The pre-ban refers to the specified guns listed in 1993 as effective on September 13th of 1994. How are you going to remember this? This presentation is going to be available to all of you. You can download it. So don't worry too much about getting notes right now. It's all going to be available to you. You can go through it at your convenience. For right now, just try to get the concepts. So conceptually, if you had a firearm, which was listed here in this list, which is in front of me, then the theory is that if it was made before the effective date, this is manufactured, not when you bought it, but when it was manufactured. That key date, once again, September 13, 1994. It's a weird date. Usually dates in Connecticut statutes are things like October 1. The reason for this date is this was the effective date of a parallel statute. It wasn't the same, but very similar, which was adopted by the federal government as an assault weapon ban, which was effective on this day. So Connecticut conformed their day to the federal day, thinking everything would line up, kind of. So they come on in and they say, listen, this is really simple. If you own one of these 56 guns, you're going to need to file a registration. If it is not on this list, you don't need to do anything and you can just keep them and you can continue to trade them as if they were not assault weapons. And of course, we looked at the list and said, um, we don't know what these guns actually are. And we're saying, well, there's, there's lots of variations of them. So which variation does this apply to? And they said, just read the list. They didn't understand that the list was not concise enough to understand what was being regulated. So what happens next? Okay. We go back and we talk with some more people. And we say, listen. The standard, the legal standard under the Fifth Amendment for due process is that a person of ordinary intelligence, a person of common intelligence must be able to tell from the face of the law what's written there, what is prohibited. I said, I've done this my entire life. I have a dealer sitting next to me who has done this for decades. We don't know what it means. What do the Democrats say? Obviously, you're not of common intelligence. You know, okay, I had to concede that one. I'll take two standard deviations to the right. Uh, what about you, legislator? Um, the statute, we understood from the beginning that if we couldn't understand it, there was no way you could understand it. And if you can't understand it, it is unconstitutional. The term is void for vagueness. Next slide. Okay, so what happens here? Uh, we come on over, we bring this into court. 
Uh, the case is called Benjamin versus Bailey. Benjamin was a, a local farmer who lived up this way. Uh, Bailey was the uh, state's attorney, the state of Connecticut. He had the enforcement power over it. There were other people named in there. And we go into the court. We made a number of claims. We made a claim that it violated your Second Amendment rights, your Article One, Section 15 rights, which is the state analog of the Second Amendment. It was actually done under Article One, Section 15 because we were in the state court. We came on in. We argued that under equal protection, guns that were banned were the same as guns that weren't banned and that this made no sense. But primarily what we argued was if we can't understand the law, it is unconstitutional. Well, unfortunately, what did the trial court judge do? She said, well, just go ask your dealer if you don't know what it is. Yeah, this made sense. So here it is. We're standing in the courtroom. Wesley Horton, author of Connecticut Constitutional Law, former law clerk to the Chief Justice of the Connecticut Supreme Court, perhaps one of the brightest constitutional lawyers we've ever had in the state of Connecticut. I'm in there on behalf of my firm, Benenson and Cates, which was a firm that was very well known for constitutional challenges. We're in front of the court. And um, as one of the witnesses, we call a dealer whose name was Frank DeAndrea. Uh, Frank at the time had one of the largest dealerships in the state and probably did more of semi-automatic rifles, other firearms. He also had what's called an SOT, special occupational tax for machine guns, uh, former Marine. And so we brought Frank on the stand. And the judge says to Frank, Mr. DeAndrea, do you know what an AK-47 is? And Frank says, yes, it is a Russian machine gun. So what's Frank saying? And what I understand him to say, what it says in here is a machine gun. Yeah, no, that's not what I think you're referring to. The judge in her decision came back and said, Mr. DeAndrea stated when we asked him whether he knew what these assault weapons were, he knew what they were. Therefore, people can just go ask any dealer and they'll just tell them what it is. Now, let me understand this. Um, you're the fox. And you're going to go on over there and um, and ask whether or not you can eat the chickens. This is no legal standard. It can't possibly be a standard. It's not objective. It is ridiculous. So obviously the case went up on appeal. Next slide. OK, so once again, we are going to bring it up. It was on a direct appeal up to the Connecticut Supreme Court. A standard is a person of common intelligence, not a dealer. So it's wrong as a matter of law. So up to the Supreme Court we go. Okay. The case is DeForest H. Benjamin Jr. et al. versus John M. Bailey et al. Before the Supreme Court of Connecticut, Wesley W. Horton, with whom were Christy Scott, Gregory J. Miller, Mark K. Benenson, four appellants, and Richard Blumenthal, Attorney General for the state of Connecticut. Now, Blumenthal, of course, is a senator today. It is likely that he has presidential aspirations. Um, people in this room may not be his biggest fan, but having spent a week shoulder to shoulder with Dick Blumenthal, I will tell the people in this room, do not underestimate your opponent. He is a very capable speaker, He's a very capable attorney. If he runs, we need to have good people in there as well. Hopefully not. All right. So we come on in here. We bring the case up to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court notes that, no, you can't just ask a dealer whether or not it's legal. And if a dealer tells you it's legal, that doesn't make it legal. So the court's stuck. What are they going to do about the fact that they have no idea what this thing means? What do they do? They find in their decision, you can just look in the uh, catalog from the manufacturer to find out whether or not it's that model. 
Oh, no, guys, you, you completely misunderstand. That is the very problem. You can't just look it up. When we say Colt AR-15, there's something like a hundred different models. Well, Dranginis in the lower court dealt with this as well. And we, we brought this and we actually brought all these guns in the courtroom. We had something like a hundred guns there in the courtroom. Uh, when I drove all the guns up to the court, we had a, a state police escort. And um, the troopers came over to us and they said, counselor, um, if you have a problem, you've got a lot more firepower there than we do. We're going to go get a cup of coffee. Call us when it's over. Thanks, guys. So we get the guns. Uh, we brought this in. We demonstrated all of this to the judge. You know, Your Honor, here is a firearm. It says this. Here is an exactly identical firearm. But because of the year, it says something different. Now it says this. Which one is the one that's regulated? And the way that Judge Dranginis got around that is she said, you look at the side of the receiver. Every firearm, by federal law, must have its make and model on it. She said, if what it says on the side of the receiver is exactly what it says in the statute, then that is the gun that's being referred to. Remember this. If there's one thing you take away from today, that's the point you need to remember. You need to actually take your firearm out and you need to see exactly what is written on that receiver. Now, if it was manufactured prior to September 13, 1994, and it does not say exactly what's in this statute. So let's say the statute says Colt AR-15 and yours says Colt AR-15 lightweight sporter. Is that different? Yes, it is. And the state has recognized this right from the beginning. And right up till this year, any variation in what was on there. How many guns are out there? And the statute says Colt, AR-15, or Sporter. How many guns have been sold by Colt that say Colt, AR-15, and nothing else for a model? It appears that there may have been something like 10 or 20 of them sold in the very early 1960s when they were still developing the prototypes. It was wrong from the beginning. Same with Sporter. It's not what's on the guns. So many of you may own pre-ban Colts. The reason that they're pre-ban, remember we talked about the specified list, and if it's on the specified list, it's not a pre-ban. The reason is what it says on the receiver is not exactly what's on your firearm. And the state has understood this. They've dealt with it, you know, for the past 30 years. And it was a large part of the driving force of the 2023 law. We'll speak about a little bit later. Next slide. Okay. So once again, that's what a pre-ban is. So under the 2023 law, they're going to compel you to register. Others will talk about that. They don't actually use that term, but we'll commonly used. And SLFU, Special Licensing Firearms Unit, use that term. So we're going to talk about what an other is, and we're going to talk about what a pre-ban is. So once again, pre-bans, non-specified firearms made prior to the effective date of the original act back in 1993. Okay, so once again, this was the date of the federal ban. We'll go to the next slide. Okay, so we've talked about this a little bit as well, that Judge Ranginis said, look at the receiver. You have to look at exactly what it says. Next slide. Okay. Now, within, remember I said there were only 56 guns on the list? Legislature lied. Imagine that. There's actually two of them say type. What is a type? Remember our void for vagueness? You have to be able to determine it's a criminal statute. It can't be vague. It has to say exactly. The word type does not belong in a criminal statute. And they have struggled with this pretty much from the beginning. 
there were two of them that were in there, AK-47 type and auto ordnance type. And then there's some bizarre thing in there about Mac 10, Mac 11, and, you know, a uh, carbine. Was well, it only the carbine? Does that mean only the one with the stock? All right, well, we'll get to there. However, the ones that we see most commonly are AK-47 type and almost never an auto ordinance type. But on the AK-47 type, um, a little later in this talk, I'm going to talk about the Kaminsky problem. Because there was a time period when the state police said it was fine to sell these as long as they were pre-banned date. And then the courts came out and they threw that back out. But generally here, for people in this room, the courts have now ruled that a AK-47 type is only firearms that use a bolt and fire control group which would fit into the semi-auto rifles, which were marketed as AK-47. Well, I'm not sure that works either, but the, the way that I look at it is if it is not 762 by 39, the original AK caliber, it is not an AK type. AKMs out there, you know, in the 556 caliber, um, there's been Valmets and 308, 223, all kinds of things. When we think about something of whether or not it can be pre banned or whether it's specified, you have to start by looking at what that caliber is, whether or not those parts are interchangeable. And we see a lot of trouble with this. I've had many clients arrested on this AK 47 type issue. Okay. So the, once again, 762 by 39. If you've got something, it looks kind of like what a Russian AK machine gun looks like. It's in 762 by 39. You can see whether or not it's got a, a bolt group, which is the same as used in other rifles there. Uh, who knows? We're still vague, but that's the theory on it. I have had three arrests on this over the last couple of years. So it, it is something you have to be very much aware of. Okay. Auto ordinance Thompson type. It got even worse. Um, Judge Dranginis at the trial court ruled that the term auto ordinance Thompson type was vague and she struck it from the statute. So as a result, in 1994, when the deadline came to file Anybody who owned an auto ordinance Thompson type was not required to register. Court had ruled it was vague. She struck it from the statute. The Supreme Court reversed. By time they reversed, it was too late to register. What they should have done is when they came back in 2001, they should have reopened it and said, listen, if we closed anybody out, you can register it now. Here we are. 30 years later, they still haven't fixed the problem. Welcome to Connecticut firearms laws. And this is typical. There's all kinds of things within the laws that just it's broken and there is no good answer of how to fix it. They could have picked it up in the latest one, but alas, no, they have not. Okay, next one here. So that gets us through 1993, effective in 94. Four. We're kind of working with a specified list. We get over to 2001 and the ledger legislature comes back and says, you know, um, we outlawed this list of 56 guns, but you know what? There's hundreds more. It didn't do a bloody thing. All that it did was made it difficult for Colt funded by the state of Connecticut to sell firearms while allowing all of their competitors to sell them with no restrictions. How that made sense is beyond me. Why did they just pick on Colt? Who knows? But in 2001, they came back and they said, you know what? We got to do something here. We got to knock out all the guns that we missed. So they come up with a characteristics test. They say, because there's too many of them to name, instead what we're going to do is we are going to come up, we're going to try and get characteristics, which will get all these guns. So no matter what it is, it's going to have one of these characteristics and we'll knock them back out. 
So they come on in and let's talk a little bit about what that is. Okay. So a part or combination of parts designed or intended to convert a firearm into an assault weapon as defined in subdivision one, that's the specified list. Okay. Well, if it's one of the guns that's already on the specified list, it's already regulated. That doesn't mean anything. Of this subsection or any combination of parts from which an assault weapon is defined in subdivision one of the subsection may be rapidly assembled if those parts are in the possession or under the control of the same person. Okay. Um, this continues into the new law. And where we're seeing this right now is let's assume that you have a firearm that is not covered by the new law. It may be a fixed magazine, so it doesn't meet the characteristics test. Also, the fundamental definition under the original act says a semi-automatic firearm with a detachable magazine. So what if you have a part to convert it back? And that kind of gets us back to this definition that the feds used to use of readily convertible. Who knows what it means? Back to void for vagueness. But what the state police have been telling us is if you can just push a button and take the fixed magazine out, we're going to say it's no good. But if, it if you have to open it up and it would require tools, then it's okay. Is that what the law says? No, but it is what the state police are saying. And we're going to get into under the new act where, where they're talking about that they put a definition of fixed magazine where it says that you have to separate the rifle, the upper and the lower, in order to remove the magazine. Well, in fact, all of the ones I know of that are being sold in Connecticut, even with that, you still can't remove the magazine. Nobody's wanted to quite tempt it quite that far, um, but we'll get over to that and specifically how it's provided for in there. Let's uh, let's go on down the list here. And, uh, let me see whether I can get my list up here. All right. So is a center fire rifle that has an ability to accept a detachable magazine and has at least two of the following. Now, this is the 2001 Act. Under the 2013 Act, two characteristics becomes one characteristic for centerfire rifles. And part of the difficulty with this that we see is that you have to know over five variations of this law, which one now applies. And just to make it a little more difficult, the 2023 Act has not been conformed into the statutes yet. So you have to sit there and look at the legislative drafts and try to figure out which pieces fit together over a couple of hundred pages. Good luck. Right. It's a mess. So part of what we're going to do here. So what have we got? Under the original Act, it would have to have a detachable magazine and... A folding or telescoping stock. Um, most have gotten around that these days by putting a pin into it. You'll see uh, lots of firearms which have got a, a stock that would be capable of moving in and out other than the fact that a blind pin has been inserted in. That makes a folding stock into a fixed stock. So... That gets you out of that provision, okay? A pistol grip that, that protrudes conspicuously beneath the action of the weapon, okay? So, pistol grip, okay? However, the way that it actually works, there are other variations of stocks. There's things like thumbhole stocks. If any finger other than your trigger finger is underneath the receiver of the action, then they deem it to be a pistol grip. Um, 
New York has got variations. California has got variations. The laws are different. Things that are legal in those states may not meet the test here. So just be aware that that definition of a pistol grip is not just what we think of as a classic AR style pistol grip. Okay. A bayonet mount. Now, this was a 2001 provision. When they came back in 2013, they took bayonet mount out. I'm not sure why, but it might have something to do that when they looked at the uh, through the, the criminal records, the number of people bayoneted in Connecticut was rather low. Bayonet lug. Really, guys, do you, do you really think this is all right? So a flash suppressor or threaded barrel designed to accommodate a flash suppressor. Okay. Now, there's two types of devices that we commonly see on the end of the barrel. A flash suppressor is a device that typically has long slots in it, and it's completely open at the end. And the way that I tell a flash suppressor, this evil flash suppressor, from a muzzle brake, which is okay, is I take my pinky, I stick it in the end of the barrel, unload it first, please, put my pinky in the end of the barrel. If I can stick my pinky in there, then the state police will consider it to be a flash hider. If it is just has a small, you know, basically bullet diameter hole in the end of it, and then typically little round holes going up and down the side, that's a muzzle brake. Muzzle brakes are okay. Flash suppressors. Really, guys, do you have any idea how loud an AR is or any other center fire rifle? You really think that suppressor, we're not going to know that a shot went off because of the fact that it has a device that, you know, moves a little bit of the gas around. Silly. But, of course, it's created great hardship. Uh, many of you who are out there who may have M1As, uh, you know, high-power rifles, things of that sort. Many have had to convert from the military-style break that's on the end over to a different one just because of the silliness of this law. Yes, Tom? Yes. That is true. Uh, if you convert over two, or if your rifle is set with a with a muzzle brake rather than a a flash hider, you do have to permanently affix. Typically, uh, your gun dealer is going to either high temperature silver soldered and pinned and weld. But if it has the threads there in order to do it, yes, you would have to permanently affix. Thank you, Tom. They also have in here a grenade launcher. Okay, you know, um, you, you just never know. Next page here. Okay, let's go down here. Okay, so it's, um, and I seem to be missing a word there. It says grenade launcher or flare launcher. Um, there are 37 millimeter flare launchers that are out there. Um, I don't know. Once again, uh, I've been doing this for almost 40 years. Uh, I've been shooting for more than that. I can't think of them. And I, I went through the worst of the crack epidemic, the cocaine, everything else through New York City, heroin. How many attacks did I see with flare launchers? Not a lot. Okay. But legislature thought it was important. So in they put it. So those were the characteristics for centerfire rifles. And in 2001, you had to have two of those. So what did people do? They had a pistol grip on it. They changed their flash hider over to a muzzle brake, and they were okay. They could still sell them. So that was 2001. You required two. It still kind of worked out for people. You know, we were doing okay. What did the law actually do? Nothing. You know, it just 
that they don't know enough fi about firearms to to regulate them. And if they knew enough about firearms to regulate them, they would realize we're not the problem and they're regulating the wrong thing in the first place. All right. Let's talk about semi-automatic pistols. Um, every now and then I get a client and I say, you know, that's an assault weapon. And they look at me like I have two heads. Okay, so once again, under the original 2001 Act, it have two of the following. Later on in 2013, two becomes one, and now under the latest Act, one becomes none. And um, and back in the day when people said this is the beginning of a confiscation and banning our guns, all the Democrats said, you guys are just paranoid. Right. The question was, were we paranoid enough? Right, not my quote. Okay, so on pistols, an ammunition magazine that attaches to the pistol outside of the pistol grip. You mean like every Olympic pistol? And here we were with every competitor preparing for the Olympics, suddenly being told, you have an assault weapon. Great. Um, they would subsequently uh, later on uh, come through and do an amendment to have some of those guns waved in. We're fighting with it to this day. As new models come out, we have to go in and we've got to get them reapproved so they can be used for Olympic competition. Silly. A threaded barrel capable of accepting a barrel extender, flash suppressor, forward hand grip, or silencer. The common question that we get is the other uh, Walther P-22. Uh, it has an extension on it, basically a weight up there for target to make it more controllable. Uh, the Connecticut State Police advise us that the thread on the Walther P-22 is not a thread that fits into a suppressor, and therefore those are not included. So if you own a Walther P-22, a very common target pistol, no, you do not have an assault weapon. There are adapters that are available where you can buy the adapter, screw it on to the end of those threads, and then that will go into a suppressor. Now you have an assault weapon. So you've just converted your legal pistol into three to five years in jail. Unless you registered it. So back in 1993, if you had come on in, if you had registered as an assault weapon, or back in 2001, if you had come through. But otherwise, have to be very careful with threaded barrels. Uh, we see it oftentimes with people who have moved into the state. Every now and then, we just find one that a dealer, not realizing, bought it in. It's sitting there in the cabinet. A lot of times, they'll have a little cap over the threads. And then you take a look at it, and it's like, oops, uh, this gun's a felony. And then you have to go in and get another barrel or you've got to have the thing welded on. Uh, I'm sorry I was late this morning. Um, a client was just advised by a police department that the firearm that he bought new from a dealer very recently and was carrying with 10 rounds in it is a high cap magazine. He's like impossible. I bought it. I just bought it from the dealer two weeks ago. They're not allowed to sell high cap magazines. Oops, mistakes are made. Do take a look at them. We're going to get down to the issue of high caps later on in this talk. But my point is, you need to kind of keep this in your back of your mind, taking a look at it. A lot of us had these high cap magazines. And when I get down to the 2013 law, we'll talk about declaration and what you can have, what needs to be done uh, if they are still high cap. Okay. Okay. A shred attached, a shroud that is attached to or partially or completely encircles the barrel and permits the shooter to hold the firearm with the non-trigger hand without being burned. Where this gets, you know, tricky is that there's a lot of firearms today that are available both as a rifle or as a pistol. Generally, they can't be sold in Connecticut anymore because characteristics, they fell under the assault weapons ban. People may have them. Um, if you have one of these larger firearms that has it, uh, some of the target guns have a, have a shroud on it. Basically, it's just weighed out there. Call me, send me a picture. 
we can oftentimes we can get a determination on it, but it's it's problematic. A manufactured weight of 50 ounces or more when the pistol is unloaded. Okay, uh, we were able to figure out what 50 ounces was, but that provision's now gone. Okay, so now we get over to a semi-automatic shotgun over there. Okay, semi-automatic shotgun that has at least two of the following, a folding or telescoping stock. Okay, there used to be various shotguns, semi-automatic shotguns that did have stocks that would fold over. Remember, under the old law, you had to have two. Now you only have to have one. A pistol grip that protrudes conspicuously beneath the action of the weapon. A fixed magazine capacity in excess of five rounds. This one we're still seeing. If you have a semi-automatic shotgun and it has a conventional stock on it, and you have, you're going to shoot IPDA, you're going to shoot three gun, going to have a magazine with more than five rounds. If it has a conventional stock on it, it's fine. If instead um, it has a, a pistol grip on it, an LA M2, I guess a bunch of them out there, uh, if it's got that pistol grip, you can't have an extended tube on it. I see them at the ranges all the time. I've seen dealers selling them. Got to watch that one. If you've got a tube that's over five rounds, now it might be a pre-ban and it might come under an exemption. And probably most of us wouldn't think about that one. But once again, thinking back, if you have an old one, it was built before 94, September 13. It's got those characteristics. It may be registrable now as a pre-ban. So it's just a lot of little twists and turns in on this thing. An ability to accept a detachable magazine. Okay. Now, I've got one. I've never fired it. Client gave it to me. Um, it's called a Kalashnikov USA Comrade. Okay. And I'm thinking about this and I'm looking at it. It's like, it's got a detachable magazine. Now it only needs one characteristic. Um, after 2013, it's not a shotgun. If it is an other, and we're going to go through the definitions of others. So if you've got one of these, why was it not illegal prior to this year? Because an other is not a shotgun. When it says a semi-automatic shotgun, that's a firearm fired from the shoulder. If it has a wrist brace on it, we have to go to a different section. And you have to get these things letter perfect. Uh, when I come in and I have to argue these things in front of a judge, I normally get a glazed look. The prosecutor will look at me like, you're kidding. Um, police departments, the last two that I've been in, I walked in. They were like, counselor, we know who you are. We have no idea what this statute means. Go take a look and tell us whether or not we screwed up. And, you know, it it literally, the cops don't know this stuff. Almost nobody does. I'm told by clients that if you call the state police, that special licensing firearms unit, and you ask the same question of two people, you can almost be guaranteed to get two different answers. If they don't understand it, it's void for vagueness. Still on the books. Okay, let's go to the next page here. Okay. A part or combination of parts, we talked about this a little bit, designed or intended to convert a firearm into an assault weapon, okay, as defined in subdivision three. Sounds like what we just read, but the prior one said as defined in subdivision one. Subdivision one was a specified list. Subdivision three is the characteristics test. So now what they're saying is let's assume that you have a perfectly legal Ruger Mini 14. Actually, close enough. Okay. Just checking action was open. Okay. It's fine. 
Now let's assume that in your closet, you've got a folding stock for this. You now have a combination of parts. You now have an assault weapon. To make this more complex, the federal courts have come in on a, a case involving ATF uh, and contender pistols. And what happens if you have a pistol barrel and a rifle barrel and stock for your contender pistol? And what they said, as long as you have a gun that it could go on to legally, it's not a combination of parts. So let's assume you have two of these. One of them is registered as an assault weapon. One is not. Our interpretation is if you have a firearm that that part can go on legally, you can own that spare part. If you have this rifle and you have nothing that that folding stock is going to fit on, except for this, you've got a felony. And of course, what happens, you know, people don't realize this. It's like, hey, cool, let's put that on. Let's take it down to the range. And they go down to one of the public ranges. And the state police have been known to walk up and down the line and just say, hey, um, you got a certificate on this? No. Would you like to surrender it? The question is, would you like to surrender it or would you like to be placed under arrest? And people lose their guns. I suppose it's better than being placed under arrest, but too many people lose their guns that way where they have no idea. So do be careful on this combination of parts. Uh, and that applies to everything, including the, the new guns. I'll take questions at the end. Yeah. And as I say, I'm going to hand this out. All right. So, 2001, we get the characteristics test. We're kind of struggling with that through the years. And along comes Sandy Hook. Um, to anybody who questions whether or not Sandy Hook was real, I knew six of the children. Um, yeah, it was real. It was a bad day. Also, my department that responded. So when we go into it, the new law comes out. And they modify the definition of an assault weapon. And one thing I haven't mentioned here, and I should have, all the way from the beginning back in 1993, there's another class of guns in there that's included as well. And that is select fire weapons. That means that it is a machine gun. It'll fire more than one shot with a single pull of the trigger. But it also can be with a selector fired semi-auto. Select fire weapons have always been assault weapons. This is from 1994 forward. So no matter what it was, our no select fire weapons been exempt from the assault weapons law. Now, here's where the problem has typically come in. If you own a machine gun in Connecticut, you must file a registration with the state police every year from the point where you bought it. So people are like, you know, did you register it under the Assault Weapons Act? Yeah, I send in my registration to state police every year. Well, as we'll talk about later with Mr. Kaminsky, that's exactly what he did. He sent his in his machine gun registration, but because he did not also register it as an assault weapon, he was arrested under the assault weapons law, and his very, very expensive machine guns were all seized. And it created further legal troubles. We'll get to the Kaminsky case. But remember the fact that if you have a firearm and it's select fire, okay, it might have an aftermarket auto sear in it. Uh, it might originally have been select fire from the factory. Um, I think you were listening to the little thing there on the news there about the infamous block switches. Um they're every place. I think they sell for about $10. I understand they're coming in out of China. They're just shipping them in. The Chinese, I believe, just want to create mayhem on our streets. And they're just putting this stuff out there. Uh, these days, uh, any smart kid with a 3D printer could make one. It's um, unfortunately, a lot of the modern gun laws make no sense now. They don't work. This is happening. But once again, if it's select fire, then you've got an issue. Next slide. 
Okay. Any of a list of named semi-automatic firearms, pistols, or center fire rifles, or copies or duplicates with their capability in production on or before the date of the new act, April 4, 2013, as set out in Appendix 1. Okay. Now, what's a copy and what's a duplicate? I don't know. Most of these words, I have no idea what they mean. I, I guess, you know, I... I Getting back to that common intelligence thing. Um, yeah, I, I don't know where these guys learn to speak English. Next slide. Okay. We're going to take a look at that list. Here's another one. Any Ismash Sega 12 shotgun or copies or duplicates with their capability in production on or before April 4, 2013. Um, once again, in the stores in Connecticut, you saw the... Um, the comrades being sold, but those were others. If they were sold as shotguns with a shoulder stock and an 18 inch barrel, 16 for rifles, 18 for shotguns, would there be a problem there? Who knows? Go back to my void for vagueness, but question mark. A semi-automatic pistol or semi-automatic center fire rifle that has a fixed magazine that can hold more than 10 rounds. Now, I don't know. Uh, fixed magazines in semi-automatic pistols? I, I guess so. I can't think of one offhand, but maybe. Um, maybe there's such a thing. Or semi-automatic center fire. There's the key word here. And I get people all the time. It's like, no, uh, you can't have a fixed magazine over 10 rounds. Center fire. Rim fire is different, although we'll see under the 2023 Act, they've made some changes in that. But traditionally, this was center fire rifles that had a fixed magazine with more than 10. Okay. In some cases, some rifles will take different kinds of ammunition. There's different lengths, things of that sort. I don't know what the answer is. You know, back to void for vagueness, but there we are. A semi-automatic centerfire rifle shorter than 30 inches. 30 inches is pretty short. Uh, if it's a rifle, it's designed to be fired from the shoulder. It's not a short barrel rifle. It's a rifle. It's got to have a 16-inch barrel. And with most of them, you know, by the time you take the action and you take the stock on it, you're going to get, you know, at least 14 inches. So generally, it's okay. But if you have one that's really small, you might want to measure it on that 30-inch that scale. Potentially, I don't know. I, I can't think of one that I've measured that was under 30. So measure it, though. But, you know, if it's under 30, you know, here it is. Okay. Okay. A semi-automatic shotgun that can accept a detachable magazine. Note others are not shotguns. A semi-automatic shotgun that has both a folding or telescoping stock. Once again, this is the 2013 Act. We read the 20, 2001 before. A grip including a pistol grip, thumbhole stock, or other stock that when used would allow a person to grip the weapon resulting in any finger on the trigger hand and any trigger finger being... Resulting in any finger on the trigger hand... And it should say any any other finger being directly below any part of the action of the weapon when firing. I took this right out of the, uh, the state OLR, but it, it actually should say any other finger on there. Okay, so kind of the same as we discussed. A shotgun with a revolving cylinder. Street Sweeper, Striker 12, I think that's the only two. Uh, they were turned into NFA weapons back in 1990-something. Um, if somebody's got a street sweeper or a striker 12, you don't have it reg registered with the National Firearms Act, uh, call me. Not, not going to discuss it here. Okay. Okay. So as we come into the new act here, okay, the definition of an assault weapon includes any semi automatic center fire rough rifle that can accept a detachable magazine, one that can be removed without disassembling the firearm action and has at least one of the following features. 
Okay, so here's the law changing here. It was two under the new law. It's now one. Now, you've probably seen some out there that have got what we call fixed magazines in them. You've got to open the top in order to remove the magazine. And in fact, every one of my clients, um, and I think everybody else is probably following their lead because they tend to be the larger guys, have done it in a there's blind bolts in there and things of that sort. Uh, what SLFU has said to me is in order to be determined to be a fixed magazine, you would have to open the upper in the action and you would require a tool to remove it. So that's the standard they have. Most dealers have gone even a step further than that. Okay, a folding or telescoping stock. Okay, once again, with a hand underneath, a forward pistol grip, a flash suppressor, grenade launcher, or flare launchers. This, once again, this is going to be under the new law. So I'll come back to that. Okay. So once again here under the new law, remember we talked about that it was two features. Now it's one feature. So we basically got the same criteria that are in there. But now rather than needing two, you only need one. So once again, we've got the threaded barrel. We've got a detachable magazine outside of the pistol grip. We have the shroud again, and we have the second hand grip. Uh, one other thing I should mention, if you have a firearm that is a pistol, not another, but if legally it is a pistol, you cannot put a forward grip one of these, onto a pistol, or under federal law, it requires a tax stamp. And it's become sufficiently complex these days as to what is an other and what is a pistol. That just be aware of the fact, you know. It's like, yeah, all my buddies have it on, you know. It's my, my AR-15 pistol here. Generally, they haven't been sold for a number of years because they, as a pistol, they came under the definition of an assault weapon. But if you have one there, now what about if it's pre-ban? Well, if it's pre-ban, then this doesn't apply on the fact that you have to register this year. So if it was a pre-ban pistol, could you put the forward grip on it? Under state law, yes. But under federal law, no. And this is where it gets utterly crazy in here. We saw this earlier this year. Many of you may have heard, if you have these others, which we're going to talk about, that you had to go with the federal government and you had to file with them something called a Form 1E to register your other as a short barrel rifle. So clients called up and it's like, okay, we did it. I've got a tax stamp here with no tax stamp on it, by the way, because they waived the fee on it. Power to raise taxes is reserved under Article One of the Constitution exclusively to the Congress. Did Congress approve that? No. Where did they get the power to waive a tax? They don't have any such power, but that's what they did. So they come on in here and clients call up. It's like, OK, it's a short barrel rifle. Now that's a short barrel rifle. Can I shorten the, uh, the barrel up to six inches and put a shoulder stock on it? No, because under Connecticut law, then it becomes an assault weapon. And at the moment, you're not registered as an assault weapon. If you have it registered with the government um, and you file under the new law, which we're going to talk about here in part two, so that you have a certificate that now it's an assault weapon, now can I put a stock on it and a short barrel? Can't convert an assault weapon into an assault weapon. Makes perfect sense, but the federal court has come in and ruled that the ATF rule R8 is invalid and has a national stay on it. So if the feds have stayed the law, meanwhile, lots of you probably went out and spent good money to buy 16 inch barrels. So you wouldn't have to register under the federal law or you took your braces off. Why? Because I told you you had to take your braces off. But then the court came and ruled the other way so what do I think? Go ahead and put your braces back on. So Connecticut uh, has publicly stated uh, in the U.S. District Court that the fact that it has a brace, they do not consider it to be a rifle. The federal law is now stayed by the U.S. District Court. So for all of you who are standing around with a rifle with a 
silly little butt piece sticking out the back and no way to shoot it, uh, go over to your neighbor, get your brace back, put it back on. At least for now, if the federal court gets reversed, which seems very unlikely, uh, three courts have looked at it. It seems pretty solid. So for now, put your braces back on. All right, let's go over to the next slide. Okay. So what we've got here, um, I'm going to leave this. You can download this presentation here. But what we've got here is the list of the guns that they added in 2013. So they say that everything that's on this list is now an assault weapon. Of course, many of the guns that are on this list have not been built after 1994. Therefore, essentially, all of them are pre-ban. If they are pre-ban, did this law outlaw them? No. And in one of the OLR comments off legislative research, they asked the question, so what about all these guns? What, what happens with pre-bans now? Well, you know, that was uh, more than 10 years ago. The state has never taken the position that there was any change in the pre-ban law. So if you have a gun on this list and it was manufactured, not when you bought it, if it was manufactured prior to September 13, 1994 as a pre-ban, you're fine. You did not have to register in 2013, although you will have to register this year. Uh, I'm going to leave it after this presentation. You people can go back there, review through this, and uh, and read all of the, the guns that are on this list. All right. So, once again, here's the reference from uh, Veronica Rose, the chief analyst at OLR back in 2013, raising the question of what do we do about these pre-bans and my response that, uh, including a comment from the prior attorney general, saying I'm aware of the fact this pre-bans, yeah, they're legal for sale. So there, there's never been any contest on that. I think we're good on, on that. Exceptions to the law, assault weapons ban um, just may impact some people in here, law enforcement and military. Members of law enforcement have to get a letter from their commanding officer that it's for duty use even if that's off-duty, duty use. I didn't make this stuff up. Okay. But if you have a letter from your chief, you are still able to go on out and buy pretty much anything you wanted. Now, let's assume rather than being, you know, a sergeant on the tactical team who's got to get a letter from his chief in order to buy a conventional AR-15, let's assume that you are an 18-year-old, you have just graduated high school, and you've joined the National Guard. Need a letter? Nope, you're military. You're just exempt. The cops look at it. It's like, I got to get a letter. And, and the 18-year-old high school student, he, he can. Yep. Okay. Says what it says. There's also a uh, an exemption in here for the uh, Nuclear Regulatory Commission and people working at the uh, at the nuclear power plants. When this law was being drafted, I got in touch with my rep. Uh, I come out of the security industry. I spent 12 years in senior management, a big security company. And um, at the time, we had worked with some of the nuclear power plants here in Connecticut and New York. And we came back and I said, are you honestly going to argue that I've got to tell my guys they can only carry 10 rounds at a nuclear power plant? So what it, my point on it was the law, the 10 round was silly, you know, for lots of occupations, we need to get rid of this. Instead, what they just, just wrote in the nuclear power plants. Yeah. All right. Is what it is. Okay. Some of you in the room uh, may have FFLs. If you have a zero one dealer's license, there is an exemption, but only if you have a permit to sell pistols and revolvers at retail, which is now becoming the new state permit to sell any firearm at retail. If you only sell at wholesale, you do not come within the exemption. If you are a manufacturer who is involved in the manufacture of either firearms that may come within this act or magazines that come within this act. Incidental to your manufacturing, you can have, you can bring in any kind of assault weapons you want and bring in high cap mags. Uh, I've got a type 10 manufacturer, destructive devices, you know, we're exempt. You know, if I 
Yeah. I need a howitzer. I can make a howitzer. I can buy a howitzer. Need a tank. That's how defense contracting works. But for those of you who may have a 07, you know, if God forbid you're out someplace, an officer comes along and says, sir, you have 11 rounds in your pistol. If the reason you're carrying that high cap magazine is you're testing something as part of your manufacturing process, if it's somehow related to your business, there is an exemption here. A good one to be aware of. Okay. Other exemptions that uh, we see fairly re frequently. Executors of estates. You've been named as the executor of an estate. Someone has passed. They've got a safe full of assault weapons. And you go over there and it's like, uh, touch these. I don't have a, a, you know, a certificate for myself. The answer is yes. You have to actually be appointed by the court. And the court issues that appointment, that PC 450. At that point, you don't need a pistol permit. You do not need assault weapons certificates. Administrators and executors are allowed to possess any firearms within an estate. Uh, that does assume that you're not a prohibited person. If you're a convicted felon, just go directly to jail. You know, no. If you're a prohibited person, you know, can't touch firearms. But assuming you're not a, a prohibited person, yes, you can take possession of anything. Uh, It does. The a trust um, when a person has died and the firearm is in the trust, um, what it provides is that it can pass down to uh, the individual who's the beneficiary of it. It does appear that trustees would come under that provision to the extent of what they are doing is handling them incidental to the distribution to beneficiaries. The statute's a little gray on it. It does refer to the fact that guns in a trust can be passed down to the beneficiary. And since there's no other way it can be done, there's no provision for a certificate, it appears that it does apply. Yeah, uh, and that is the right answer. It's a little more complex. Uh, you can't, things that cannot be transferred right now, uh, anything that can't be transferred because an assault weapon cannot currently be transferred into a trust. If it's in a trust already from prior to this, then that trustee would be able to act. Uh, but in most cases, yeah, the answer is call my office and... You know, we'll go through it with you and figure out what needs to be done with it. Just a little side note for the people that are online. If you're not speaking into a mic, they will not be able to hear the question. So if you have an important question and you want others to hear the question, please come up, grab the mic. Yeah, as I say, I'll try and take questions at the end. All right. I'm going to hit the Kaminsky fiasco right here, and then I'm going to take suggest we take a five-minute break. Um. After the 2013 law came in, uh, there was a question as to exactly what a pre-ban was after the 2013 law. The OLR, Office of Legislative Research, had asked the question as to what was the applicability of pre-ban under the new law? Had it changed? A letter was sent by an attorney to the commissioner of the state police as they regulate the licensure of a so-called assault weapons. It was reviewed by the legal department at the state police and a letter was issued by commissioner Bradford on state police letterhead finding that the 2013 law had changed the law on pre-ban and under the new law, any firearm manufactured prior to September 13 of 1994 was considered to be pre-ban, whether it was on the specified list or not. And all my dealers called up and said, Miller, you idiot. 
all these years, we haven't been selling these guns because you told us we can't sell specified guns. And what do I say? I spoke among my colleagues and I said, you know, we're not going to say anything. So we just kind of stood down. I had great doubts about this, but he is the commissioner of Superior Court. Uh, he had made a decision. It is in writing. It was reviewed by their legal department. Their legal department typically, you know, goes up to the attorney general's office. It was in writing. So that's what they wrote. And as long as nobody challenged it in court, it was great. The problem was in the Kaminsky case, we talked about the individual who had a select fire firearm. And even though it was registered as a machine gun and he had a tax stamp, the state tried to prosecute him because it wasn't registered as an assault weapon. And counsel came in and said, you're wrong. It's a pre-ban. It's exempt. And Judge Bright over in New London came back and said, no, the state police have no power to make laws. They're wrong. And therefore, I'm going to rule that as a specified firearm, it's not a pre-ban. Well, by this point, many had been sold in Connecticut. 10,000, 20,000, we don't know. No, I've never heard a, a number on it. And the question was, what are we going to do for all of these people who relied upon a written statement from the state police that these guns are legal and now have been overruled by the court in New London. And I spoke to the state police and I said, listen, I spoke to the legislators. I said, you guys have to fix this. You screwed it up. You need to fix it. You need to simply put a bill in that anybody who in good faith bought a firearm legally under this provision, relying upon the state police, they'll be allowed to register it now. Here we are 10 years later. They haven't done it. So here we come up on the new registration. What are you supposed to do if you have one of these guns? So I wrote back to the state police and I said, listen, you got two choices right now. Number one, allow people to register these. Or number two, under Connecticut General Statutes 53-6, a person who relies upon a written opinion of a regulatory agency having authority may not be criminally prosecuted for any violation of the law. What does this mean? This means that if the state of Connecticut would like to take the position that you cannot register the so-called Kaminsky guns and they want to prosecute you, you have an absolute defense under 53-6 of having relied upon a written statement of the commissioner. What? Yeah, I mean, 53-6 is in writing. I've tried to get the state police to respond. They will not respond. I am told that off the record, uh, they have told dealers across the state that if your clients have one of these guns, if they attempt to register it under the new registration, we will issue a registration certificate for it. That's what we do not have in writing. Uh, this is an impossible situation. Uh, there's not an answer. The, they created this problem. They need to fix this problem. Um, my thoughts on it are, if you have one of these guns, go ahead and file the registration under the new law, which when we come back from the break, we're going to start going through how to do that. Because if you file it and they issue it, you've got a certificate. If you file it and they deny it and try to do anything about it, then you come back to 53.6 and say, hey, I'm exempt. Might they be able to confiscate? We don't know, but they can't prosecute. So it is, it's a very poor situation without a good answer involving a lot of people across Connecticut. Many of them don't realize the situation exists. Because when I talk to them, they're like, I bought it from a dealer. It was registered. I did a DPS three. So thousands and thousands of them, people have no idea. I am hopeful that the state is going to allow people to simply register them 
to resolve this because there's not another good answer to it. Let's take five minutes here, and uh, we're going to get into 2023 law, and uh, from there, exactly what you have to do in order to register under it and other requirements under the new law.